Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Frengel, and I am the curator of rare books at the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Chicago. Um, it is morning here in Chicago. I realize it's afternoon or evening for some of you, but I'm really glad to be with you um, and take you on a tour of some of the, a few of the beautiful books and manuscripts and prints that caught my eye in the Masterpiece Fair. Um, the collection that I look after at the University of Chicago is interesting. It's, it's a really broad and deep collection. It's about 350,000 rare books and manuscripts um, that really span quite a swath of time from um, ancient papyri to modern artist books and works that were produced this year. So I tried to select items from the fair that also reflect, um, also reflect what is um, in the collection that I look after. So I think I'll start with the first item. And this is a really, to my mind, very beautiful uh, book of hours. It's the hours of Francoise de Foix. Um, it was made in Normandy in northwestern France sometime between 1480 and 1490. And A Book of Hours is a devotional text. It's a very highly personal work. Um, and this is a very beautiful example. Um, medieval um, books of hours are really could be thought of as medieval bestsellers. Um, and you can see all the, the care and the craft that went into making this. Is, this is a manuscript on parchment. So parchment is made from the skin of a goat or a calf. And it takes a lot of labor um, to make such, you know, finely, uh, such a finely wrought uh, writing surface. And then it has been decorated by hand. I think the striking, um, the, the vibrancy of the pigments that are evident here were something that just really struck me as being so beautiful. The blue of Mary's robe um, that comes from a natural mineral, uh, lapis lazuli probably. Um, and the, um, um, of course, the gold leaf too. Um, this, uh, the text here is in predominantly in Latin and also in French, but you can see along the right, the writing, it's a really um, beautiful Gothic book hand. It's highly legible. And that's because there's a lot of space between the lines and even between the words, which is a little bit unusual, but it's, you know, even if you don't read Latin, it's easy to make out. Um, this particular manuscript has four spectacular full page miniatures and it's decorated throughout with a lovely border um, and lovely borders and rubrications that are very illustrative of the French style of illumination. Um, as I mentioned, this, this book was believed to have belonged to Francoise de Foix. Uh, she was the Comtesse de Chateaubriand and also the mistress of King Francis I. Now you can't see the binding here, but it is also very lovely. It's a 16th century olive um, gold tooled Morocco and that was made by the Royal Atelier of King Henri III of France. And, um, it has been rebound, so it, it, it wasn't bound, um, this is not the original binding for the manuscript, but I did want to point out before we move on to the next slide that um, the, the, I mentioned that the text is very highly legible and the, um, the margins in this book are very interesting too. I just wanted to point out maybe um, something you don't, wouldn't notice at first glance, but um, the margins are very deep at the bottom slightly less deep along the side and then narrower along the top. And that is the platonic golden mean or golden ratio that makes that text on the page so pleasing to the eye. So there are a lot of details that went into the making of this manuscript. And this is offered by Les Illumineurs. So um, could you go on to the next slide? This is Thomas Malton's a picturesque tour through the cities of London and Westminster. And it was published over nine years between, um, nine or 10 years between 1791 and 1801, um, published by subscription. It is two volumes in one. So it's folio sized and it's bound in red Morocco. And it contains 100 plates that were printed and mailed to subscribers from June 1792 to March 1801. And this is an interesting work because it's the first work to depict London using the aquatint process. And aquatint, just by looking at this, you can see very plainly, gives a beautiful, beautiful tonal qualities to the etchings. 
Aquatint is an intaglio process. I always like to think, you know, to remember what that means. It's sort of the op opposite of relief printing. Um, it was in the, I guess it was, you could say Aquatint was invented um, by a man, a, a painter and a printmaker named Jan van de Velde um, in Amsterdam in 1650. But it wasn't really um, perfected until the 18th century, um, till about 1768. And this is just a really stunning example. Now, as I mentioned, these, the 100 plates were sold by subscription. And the plan for this undertaking was advertised in a prospectus um, that Malton published that was put out and it told potential buyers um, exactly what they would get and how they would get their plates and how much it would cost and how they would remit payment. It's kind of interesting. Um, they could even go to Mr. Malton's gallery at number eight Carlisle Street in Soho to get a preview of some of the views. And I can read, you know, he left absolutely nothing to chance in the execution of this work, which is very interesting to me. I can read to you a bit from the prospectus. Um, he says, this is a series of prints exhibiting the most interesting scenes in London and Westminster, and they are drawn from the most striking points of view and executed in aqua tinta. The size of the plates are to be 20 inches long by 14 wide, two to be published every four months, and the price half a guinea to be paid on delivery. Specimens of the subjects intended to be seen at Mr. Malton's, number eight Carlisle Street, Soho, where subscriptions are received. Also at any of the capital print shops in town, and subscribers may depend on having their first and best impressions. There will be some impressions taken off on imperial paper and tinted from the original drawings and the price for those mounted are two guineas a pair. Um, now this is an important point that he makes that subscribers are promised the early impressions because the plates um, for this particular work would have been either copper or zinc, which are a little bit softer metal and wear down quickly. Um, this is a very rare work. According to my reckoning, there are only um, seven complete copies it held in institutional libraries in the United States and seven, another seven in the United Kingdom. So, and that's according to my research, of course, there could be copies out there in private hands, but um, doesn't come up too often. So I, I wanted to point this one out. Can we move on to, the, um, and this is offered by Shapiro uh, Rare Books. And, okay, thank you. Um, so this is another rare survival, very interesting. Um, if you haven't looked at, had a, the opportunity to look at a lot of early manuscripts or early printed books, um, you can be forgiven for thinking that this is in fact an illuminated manuscript, but it's not. This is a printed book of hours. Um, it was printed by Germain Audouin in Paris in 1536. Um, Paris was the center of production for printed books of ours. I don't know if I mentioned it, but when we were looking at that beautiful manuscript book of ours a moment ago, um, it was produced in Normandy, but really Rouen was the center of production for manuscript book of ours. Um, and I, I chose this as an example because what you see here to me is so interesting um, as a curator and as someone who's very interested in book history, you see playing out on the pages, very interesting tension between manuscript culture and book culture. Um, the text is in Latin um, and it also emulates a book hand. This is the, the Roman, it's Roman type, it's highly readable, maybe not quite as beautiful as the example that we looked at in the manuscript, but beautiful nevertheless. Um, and this is printed on vellum, not paper. So um, again, hard to see or you don't have the book in hand. But if at first glance you thought that um, this was a manuscript, then you made the printer, um, Mr. Ardouin, a very happy man because um, even though this is printed a good while after the incunable period ends, which is roughly 1501, um, what we see in the specimen is a determined effort to produce something that looks and feels like an illuminated manuscript. So after the printing, it was illuminated, if you will. Um, but this book was produced using mechanical means, movable type and engraved plates. Um, this one has 14 large metal cuts and one smaller metal cut that were then, after the printing, colored by hand. Um, 
Also, what's unusual to point out about this book, it's a little bit difficult to see this when it's digitally rendered, but this is an interesting format. It's wallet sized, um, small about five and a half inches by two and a quarter inches, five and a half inches high by two and, two and three fifths inches wide. So um, could fit potentially in your pocket or your wallet. Or it's known as agenda format. Um, very few examples of these survive. Um, and this is a very interesting and beautiful one. So could we move on to the next one, please? Now, this is a beautiful work of natural history. John Gould's The Birds of Great Britain, um, published um, over a, also over a 10-year period from 1863 to 1873. Um, this is just a beautiful first edition of these plates. Um, it's five volumes in all, and it's a folio size, and they contain 367 hand-colored lith lithographed plates. Um, after the artists John Gould, Joseph Wolf, and H.C. Richter. Um, this was published by subscription, like Thomas Malton's Views of London, um, and it was exceedingly well received when it came when the, the publication was announced. And the plates themselves are really remarkable for their animated depiction of British birds and their natural habitats. I would say that, you know, it, it is said that next to Audubon, John James Audubon, uh, John Gould was considered one of the greatest illustrators of birds. And the way this was produced was Gould would um, make a rough sketch of a bird in its natural habitat. And then um, Wolf and Richter would make the finished drawings, which were then redrawn onto the lithograph stone by another, by another artist. And in the last stage, they were colored by hand. Um, and it, Gould was very proud of the quality that resulted from this elaborate production process. And he remarked in the preface of this book that many of the public are quite unaware how the coloring of these large plates is accomplished. And not a few believe that they are produced by some mechanical process or by chromolithography, which they are not. Um, this, however, is not the case. Every sky with its varied tints and every feather of each bird were colored by hand. Um, and when it is considered that nearly 280,000 illustrations in the present work have been so treated, it will most likely cause some astonishment to those who give the subject a thought. And this truly is an astonishing work, one of great beauty. And this is offered by Shapiro Rare Books. So if we can move on to the next one. I chose this. Um, it's an interesting way if you're interested in collecting rare books um, and you are interested in English literature or the British novelists, um, this is a really great way to um, jump in. This is a complete set of first editions of Thomas Hardy's novels and short story collections um, going up to 1897. Um, the, the collection does not include his poetry or his prose essays, and he did publish in 1913 one collection of short stories that's not included here, but um, it's still a really fantastic collection. Ha Thomas Hardy is, to my mind, still an overlooked um, an overlooked novelist, um, one of the great English novelists, his work really foregrounds modernism. And while many people have either read or probably seen the film version of Tess of the Durbervilles and Far From the Madding Crowd and The Mayor of Casterbridge, um, he, in my mind, wrote many other great works. Um, the Return of the Native is one that comes to mind and uh, The Well Beloved, which is one of his last novels, 1897. Um, that's a Pygmalion story that's really excellent and is seldom discussed today. Um, there are 17 titles represented here in 38 volumes and they're bound in half uh, Morocco and half marbled board um, with beautiful gold tooling on, and decoration on the spines. Um, and this is, as I said, just a really great way to get a fine set of the um, novels and short stories of Thomas Hardy. And if we can move on to the last slide, please. So I was asked to choose five items, but I decided um, I couldn't live without having six. And I wanted to include this map offered by Daniel Crouchware Books. Um, it's a 
modern map of Silicon Valley. And this was made by Marianne Regal Hoberg. Um, and it's a proof map. So this really is one of a kind. No other um, copy out there has been traced. Um, it was made by a small graphic arts company in California in 1982. And it's very interesting for the details that are here. If you have a chance, I would encourage you all to go to the exhibitors websites for all of these items because you get um, multiple views of openings and details that are difficult to see on the screen here. But um, this really captures, it's kind of an amusing piece, but it's also a very important piece of history. Um, as I mentioned, this was published as a proof, um, proof copy in 1982. There are some typo, typographical errors in it, but it also um, captures a moment in time. Um, so Atari, for example, is one of the companies represented here that would go bankrupt two years later. Um, there's Apple with its rainbow logo that is depicted here. And it's just sort of fun to see. Um, and as I mentioned, this is just something that um, is very unusual, um, but very interesting from a graphic perspective and also from an in historical perspective. So um, I think that's all that I have for today. Um, if you have questions that you would like to ask me, I will do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, we have some questions. Um, so the first one is asking, um, with, the, with the first example you spoke about, how have the colors stayed so rich in the hours of Francoise de Poirot? Um, because, is it because it has been mostly closed um, or is it because they used materials such as lapis? That is an excellent question. This manuscript has obviously been very well cared for. Um, sometimes you do see early manuscripts from the medieval period where the gold has been scraped off or you often see books that are heavily used. used you'll see um, wearing in the corners where pages are turned, but you don't see that here. So yes, it's possible that it has been mostly closed. I, I like that the way that question is framed, um, but this is very well preserved. And, and it is a combination of just the highest quality materials that were used, the parchment, um, the pigments, were made from natural materials and um, just have a staying power that materials that are used to make books today don't always have. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, what is your advice as to how to display these individual gems, these jewels that are bound in volumes? Is it something that can be easily done? They look so fragile and delicate. You know, that's, that's an, uh, also an interesting question to me because I've spent so much time in the company of old and rare books. And I must say that, first off, the older a piece is, I mean, depending on the, the conditions it's endured through time, um, those tend to have a better survival rate because of the quality of the material. So even books printed mechanically on paper in the 16th century will usually hold up a little bit better, almost certainly better than a book printed on paper in the 19th century um, because paper was made of organic materials like cotton, linen, or rag. Um, whereas now, um, and certainly in the 19th century, paper was highly acidic. And so you get that crumbling of, you know, I love Dickens, um, but if you look at a lot of the first editions, they're, they're very fragile. Um, I would say generally speaking, it's not, I mean, it really depends on what your situation is. Um, you always, if you, you know, buy a print or buy a rare book, um, you want to keep it out of direct sunlight. Absolutely, I think that's the number one cardinal rule. The second one would be to really avoid uh, rapid changes in the environment, so spikes in humidity. And I'm talking to you from Chicago where we had violent storms all last night. It is so humid. <laughs> right now in my apartment, it feels like a sauna. Um, so books don't like humidity. Um, a book that is made on parchment will just suck that humid, it's an organic material, so it'll just suck that humidity into its pages and they can become brittle. Um, so try to avoid um, spikes in humidity, spikes in temperature, or, drop, or rapid drops in temperature. It's not always possible. Um, I would say that you, know, you can't always, you know, in your living space, have a tightly controlled temperature and humidity point that like we do in institutions, at least in the United States. But it's, you know, I would say 
avoiding any direct sunlight and um, trying to be mindful of the environment are your two best bets. Watercolors, yeah, you want to keep out of the sunlight, definitely. Thank you. Um, and then a question about the second um, book of hours, um, asking if the manuscript is gilded. It does have gold paint in it, yes. And that would have, I don't know if I mentioned it when I was addressing that one particularly, but that would have been done after the printing. Um, and those are, we be believe, to be metal cuts, although um, Laser Luminar makes the point in their catalog record, and I do hope that you'll go and visit their website to look at this this particular example more closely, and they have a really excellent description of this. Um, they mentioned that there's no trace of the imprint from the metal cut, that it has been painted over so completely that you really can't see that. So it sort of asks the question, well, is this really an illumination? Is it, is it a colored um, metal cut or is it an illumination? And that is something worth for further study um, and makes this particular book all the more interesting. Um, but yes, that is um, gold, gold paint that would have been added after the printing was done. And all those rubrications that you see there, that would have been done after the, the printing. Um, and I think this next question is sort of linked to what you've just said, actually, um, but it's asking the difference between manuscripts and manuscript paintings. Okay. Uh, so maybe I could ask you to elaborate a little bit. Like, are you asking how they're produced? Um, there are different roles. So your scribe would your your scribe would be the one who would copy the text, and your illuminator would um, be responsible for you know painting it basically. Um, so those are two different roles. Sometimes there are two different places where they happen. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's, we've had two questions actually asking the same the same thing about the Thomas Hardy collection um, and the fact that. Um, there are all the books of different heights and sizes, and is this usual? And what what what's this down to? That is such a good question. Um, I have I wish I had the chance to examine them. Um, it really depends upon um, you know rebinding because they would have been bound as a set. So in some cases they'll need to be cut down, um, but it really depends upon the the issue um, of of the particular. Of the particular work. So um, a lot, I mentioned that that was um, 17 works in 38 volumes. Um, a lot of his novels typical for the 19th century were what we call triple decker. Um, and so they would have been published in more than one volume, usually three. Um, so, but yes, I do see now there are some are slightly, they're almost quarto size to my eye, but looking at them digitally, it is hard to say with certainty. So I would encourage you to um, go to Peter Harrington's website and look at that. And I do know um, the, the gallery would be so happy to talk in more detail about, about the um, collection of Hardy. Thank you. And then two final questions, which are returning to the manuscripts again, and I'm going to combine them as one question. Um, so the first part is, what is the difference between parchment and vellum? And then the second part is, um, with manuscripts, is it possible to decipher the artist's hand? And do we know who the artists were? Okay, those are very good questions. So the difference between parchment and vellum is really a matter, I think, of quality and source. So, um, as I mentioned, it could the the skin could be from a, a goat or a calf, um, and it depends on how um, finely it's worked. Um, parchment. Think of parchment as a general term, like paper, but then you have gradations like imperial paper or um, you know uh, different types of paper. So parchment is sort of the general term to imply that it is not. Um, to differentiate it from, from um, being from the organic skin and not um, plant material. And then I'm sorry, what was the second question? The second question was about the artists and whether you whether it's possible to decipher different artists in different manuscripts. Yes, so this is very interesting work that goes into um, to describing um, and researching a medieval manuscript, and, and particularly one that's illuminated. So um, there is detail about the illuminations for that manuscript um, 
compared to other examples in public institutions um, that show similar style. Um, so that's how, you know, it's always, I mean, unless, you know, it's hard to speak definitively, but you do have to compare with, um, compare with styles to make a guess. And usually you're, you're, um, you're, you get as close as the workshop to where the manuscript was made. Thank you. And then the final question, um, is there anywhere to learn more about rare book collecting? Yes, um, there are many great sources. Um, in the United States, um, there's the American, book the American Antiquarian Booksellers Association, and they um, have some really excellent resources on learning more about rare books and, and their values. Um, I had two examples from Les Illuminar, and um, they have published these really great little primers on one on books of ours, one on liturgical texts, one on law. Um, that you, you, they're essentially primers on um, on the subject of early books and manuscripts. So that's a really great resource. Also, the the um, exhibitors here are so knowledgeable about book history and about the items they have. So I always learn from talking with my colleagues and especially the antiquarian book dealers that I know.